Take just a moment to thank uh, Lori and Royce for willing to leave the frigid country of Michigan. I mean, you think last week it was 100 degrees colder there than it was here. I'm also glad they took time with their very busy schedules. Um, Joyce, but Lori is a uh, counselor, accomplished writer, and an inspirational speaker, and a great children's storyteller. And Royce comes to us, he is a pastor's pastor, he's the ministerial secretary uh, for Michigan, as well as the evangelism coordinator. I'm certainly glad you joined us.
And Vedic's father had actually gotten in the pool and was trying to save the man, but he couldn't swim. He went in there with a floaty or an inner tube, whatever it was he had, but he couldn't reach the man and he wasn't able to do anything to help. Lalitha knew that her son had taken swimming lessons and as they had watched their son uh, participating in these swimming lessons, they noticed something about him and that is that he liked to dive underwater and it was a thing that I used to do as a child as well. They would throw rings that would sink down to the bottom of the pool and kids would dive down. It was a great game, but they were actually learning a very important skill, and that is how to hold their breath and swim at the same time. And he'd done a fantastic job at playing that game, and she knew that about him. So she challenged him to dive in the pool. And he said that if it hadn't been for his mom telling him he needed to get in there, he would have certainly hesitated because this is a little boy with a big grown-up man that he's being challenged to go in and to save. But he did. He jumped into the water. He dove down to where that man was. He grabbed a hold of his wrist. He pulled the man to the surface. His father was up at the surface with his inner tube. He took the man and he pushed him off to the side of the pool. The other men grabbed him from the edge of the pool. They pulled him out onto the out of the pool onto the side of uh, the pool under the uh, concrete around the pool. And uh, Advaik's uncle was there, Sasil. And he began CPR, and he did that for about three minutes, and uh, about three minutes later, the man's eyes opened, and he began to uh, move his hand, and about the same time, the paramedics showed up, and they put oxygen on him. They rushed him off to the hospital in the ambulance, and later that evening, he was back home, none the, less, none the worse for wear. Amen? Amen. Now, just the details of that story kind of got my attention. I want to come back to it in just a moment because I think they're significant. But you know, sometimes people wonder, you know, like Advaic maybe, you know, like, why me? Like, why 80 pound me? Why not these men? Why not somebody else? Why do I have to be here at this moment? Many people ask similar kinds of questions. Why do I matter? Do I even matter? I don't make a difference, really, do I? No one would even know if I weren't even around. Many people say, what, can, what do I have to contribute? How can I make a difference? And I want you to go to your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter, I said 2, I mean 12. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, very familiar to Christians and Seventh-day Adventist Christians. But I want you to look at it again, and look at it in light of what we are going to be discussing here, and what we are discussing. Beginning with verse 20, Paul makes this comment. He says, but now indeed there are many members, yet one body, look around you today. There are many members. Some of you may not be members, you may be visitors, but you're still part of the body of Christ. Someone already reminded us there are 20 million plus members of the body in the world, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and even beyond that. And verse 21 says, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Verse 22, no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are what? Necessary. Now I want you to think about this passage and especially that verse that we just read in the last word that we just read from there in the New King James Version. It says necessary. Necessary, not just wanted, not just important. They are necessary. Necessary means they are needed. The dictionary includes required or essential. 
Now, I know people, including our adopted son, who is missing an arm. He's still able to function in life. As a matter of fact, he does more than function. He's an accomplished musician, plays the trumpet. He doesn't have a right hand. And if any of you play the trumpet, you know how important the right hand is to playing the trumpet. But he's an accomplished musician working on a PhD in music performance and education. He was able to get by without an arm. But let me tell you, he would be happy to have the arm. Both arms. It would be a lot easier. That's the way God designed us in order to be able to function. The Bible says they're required. All of us are required. All of us are essential. Yes, we can get by sometimes without, but the body is functioning at its best when it is fully equipped when it is able and healthy enough to do the work it was intended to do. Paul tells us that everyone is essential, essential in order for the church to be able to accomplish its purpose. That doesn't mean that we can just sit and look. There are times when sitting and looking actually is part of the function. I'll mention that here in a moment. But I'd like us to consider some facts about the times in which you and I are living. Consider the situation with Little and Vague. It was an emergency. It was a literally a life and death emergency. That man, that day, was going to die and was even at that very moment dead and dying, or dying and dead, if it hadn't been for what that young boy did, recognizing it was a life and death emergency. I'd like to suggest today you and I are living in a just as serious an emergency. Amen. It's very easy for us to sit here and say, oh, you know, I'm going to go home, I'm going to eat today, and I'm going to go on. Yes, you will. Probably. Most of us will. Go home. Maybe all of us go home today. But there are going to be people out there that are dying today. And they're not just dying like that 34-year-old man was dying that day. They're dying a death from which there is no resurrection. I'm talking about a resurrection to eternal life. They may be dying to a resurrection from which there is the second death. You and I have a message to give today about Jesus. And the fact that Jesus loves us. And that Jesus is coming back, coming back again soon. That message is a message that is an emergency message. If you go to Revelation chapter 14, where we'll be coming a little later in the Sabbath school study, we'll be reminded of the fact that we have a vital, a critical, the most essential, and Ellen White calls it the most precious message, the third angel's message that we need for this day and age. Jesus is coming again. People need to know. And if they die without that knowledge, they will die permanently. That man, that 34-year-old man, went home that night. I hope he learned about Jesus, learns about Jesus somewhere along the line. Because I believe God saved his life for a reason. Amen. <coughs> you and I need to realize that every one of us have a part to play in letting people know that Jesus is coming again soon. I don't have time to go through the message. We'll talk about that when we get to spend some time in April about the fact that this is the time that Jesus is coming back. That as Christians who've been studying the Word of God and you're sitting here today because you know that number one, you love Jesus and you're excited that He's coming back again and you know that's very, 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 very soon. These are the last days, my brothers and sisters. There are no more to follow when these are done. These are the last days. As in when these days end, it's all over. That means it's an emergency. This is it. This is the time the Bible predicted and said would be here. It is the time that when we face this and we get to the other side of this emergency, it's all over. It's finished. That is an emergency. It really is a life and death situation. 
I don't know why you come to church on Sabbath morning, but I suspect it's because you love Jesus. I suspect that you have a good reason for coming to church, and it's probably the reason that Paul mentions in Hebrews chapter 10. Would you turn with me there, please? Hebrews chapter 10. We look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and we look at verses 23, 24, and 25. Paul makes this statement. He's been talking about the sanctuary all in the, in the book of Hebrews. He's talking about Christ, the high priest. That in itself is a whole other sermon. I really have about four sermons I'd like to preach today. I hope it's okay. <laughs> Except I probably need to get done. So I'll try to summarize them all together in what we're talking about. But in verse 23, this is what Paul says after reminding us about Jesus, the high priest over the house of God in verse 21. Verse 23, he says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Don't you? Aren't you grateful that you serve a faithful high priest? A faithful Lord Jesus Christ? He is the prince. He is the king. He is the priest. He is our Savior, yes. and He's faithful to us, not just in the past, but He is faithful to us in the present. He is working in the heavenly sanctuary for you and for me today, preparing us for the return that He is going to be at the center of so very soon. Then he says, Paul says in verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Did you catch that? Amen. You know, we've read that passage, and I've read it before. But as I was preparing for the sermon, I'm looking at that passage, and I say, you know, why didn't I see that before? Why didn't I catch that in that passage before? Because most of the time we go to verse 25, and we miss verse 24. Mm. Let's go to 25, and then come back to 24. You remember 25? Oh, yeah. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you what? See the, See the day approaching. But let's go back to verse 24, 3, 4, sorry. <laughs> Let, go back to all of them, we want to here. Verse 24, in order to stir up love and good works. Amen. Did you know how important you are to the person sitting next to you? Do you understand what the message of the love of Christ is all about? It's not just about the fact that you need to be obedient to God's commandments. It's about the fact that love and law go together with each other. And the fact of the matter is that what Christ has done for us also helps my neighbor. Because as it helps me, it helps them. As you help, as, as I help you, you're helping me. The Bible says that we should be stirring each other to love and good works. I was reading something on the plane coming down. Powerful little booklet that was shared with me just recently, written by a man that I think I met a long time ago. He used to be the pastor of the Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda. His name was Bill Lehman. He wrote this little booklet called Charms of Christ. What? No, Lehman. The real one. <laughs> L-E-H-M-A-N is his name. But he brought something out in there that just stirred my heart. I had been trying to kind of put some things together and, and what he shared there was, was powerful. He reminded us of how important the love of Christ is to the work that God has given us to do. I, and you, I started dawn on me why it's so important for me and for you to be the bearers of the message that God has given us. Why? Because you see, it's only love that will save people. Are you with me? You and I cannot save people simply by telling them that the seventh day is the Sabbath. 
That will not save them. Are you with me? Yes. Now don't, don't look at me with blank looks here. I want to make sure you're still with me. The Sabbath is important. It's clear in the Word of God. Absolutely clear. But it's, it's important because it's part of God's message of love to the world. Yes. You, you understand? The, the message of love to the world was demonstrated by Jesus. Yes. Jesus demonstrated His love by being obedient and also always being obedient even to the cross. He was obedient by living the Sabbath. He was obedient by living the Ten Commandments in all of their forms. He was obedient. But what drew people to Jesus was the tremendous love He had for them in drawing them. And as they drew closer to Him, they wanted to be obedient to Jesus. That's why the demoniac, when he came in contact with Jesus, could respond to Him and say, I don't want to leave you. Yeah. And, you and I'll obey you. I'll do whatever you want. I'll, I'll stay here. And Jesus said, please be obedient to me. Go back and tell other people. Why? Because Jesus had demonstrated love to him in such a way that he could go back and not just tell them that the seventh day was the Sabbath or that you shouldn't worship idols, but he could also tell them that Jesus loved them and he could demonstrate that by the love he showed to people. And when Jesus came back again, it wasn't the message of the Sabbath that drew those people back. It was the message of the love of Jesus Christ that drew those people back to him. And when Jesus came, that whole Decapolis area came and flooded to see Jesus because of what that man said. Amen. It's because of the love of Christ and what he did led to those people wanting to be obedient to Jesus too. So, Jesus tells us through Paul, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That's a whole other, that's, that's part of that sermon I wanted to preach. And that's the, that's the last 45 minutes, okay? So we're going to skip that part for right now. The two working together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Don't miss the assembling of ourselves together. You know, as I sit here and I look out over this congregation today, I preach to audiences in a similar time, sized facility with 10 people. Most of whom are non Adventists wanting to hear the message that the Bible has for these last days. Same size bill, 10 people. I've had people hear about the message, say, oh, man, this is fantastic, this is exciting. So they, they surrender their lives to Jesus and they come to church and then they find all these people in the church. Like it is today. And they say, now wait a minute. How come when you were preaching this message that's so powerful that's changed my life, there were 10 people there and now there's 150 people here? I don't know how many people here. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are people that don't make decisions to follow Jesus and the truths of the Word of God because they feel like they're all alone. They'd be all by themselves. They come out to uh, an evangelistic meeting and they look and they see there's only 10 people there and they say, man, this is an unpopular message. I don't want to be here. When you come to an evangelistic meeting, the one we're going to do here in April, and this place is full like this and people are looking for a place to sit. It actually encourages their heart. It doesn't discourage them. Amen. That's called, the uh, my, my way of putting it, evangelism by attendance. You don't have to preach a word. The truth is, your presence says more than your absence, or and says more than the preacher can actually say. Amen. I want you to understand how important that is. So Paul is talking about assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you say that, see the day appearing. You and I need to come together because by our love for each other, we will strengthen each other. We will encourage each other. We will help one another. Where I am weak, you are strong by the grace of God. That's how God has made us. 
And where I'm strong, you may be weak. And together by prayer and supplication and coming before the Lord, Lord and worship and, and, uh, and study together, we get stronger together. But when you try to fight the devil out there by yourself, you know by yourself you understand the Lord's out there with you. But when you, he's made us a body for a reason. The body is stronger fighting against the enemy than a body is, uh, part of the body is by itself. The hand can, you know, using the war illustration, a hand can, might be able to handle a sword, but the sword needs, a hand needs an arm in order to be able to continue to wield that sword. But the, so arm, the hand and the arm need the body to be able to get around and use that sword as it needs to be used. You get the message that Paul is trying to bring out in Hebrews. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as we spoke just a moment ago. <clears throat> to make some sense of all of this, I would like to suggest to you that the time has come for us to stir up love and good works among all of us. Paul says that everyone is essential, is needed. That means you are needed, you are essential, you are necessary. This evangelistic meeting happens, and it is as full as it is today, it will be successful. But if 75, 80% of you are gone, it will be as successful as your absence. You catch that was a minus negative. Is there such a thing, Deborah? Paul says that we are in the last days. We really need to help each other. It's an emergency here, folks. Amen. It's the last days. So I want to encourage you that you are needed to help to save people in the last days who need your help or they will die. But a lot of people say, I don't know how. Oh, no, somebody else says, I'm too busy. Somebody else says, I'm not a leader in the church. Somebody else says, I'm just a member, but I'm just a little too old or I'm just a little too young. Or I'm just not this, or I'm just not that. I don't really matter. I'm not really needed. No, wrong. I don't care what your position is or isn't. I don't care what your strengths or weaknesses are. You are necessary, according to Paul. Yes. We are all necessary. I'd like to go back to the opening illustration I shared with you for a few moments. Think about little and vague. You know the one who was the hero of Hale and CNN? Was that 11-year-old boy because of what he did. And you know what? I'm not going to deny that. He dove into that water. He brought that man out of that water. But let me tell you, that man did not survive just because of what little Advaig did. Am I right? Are you with me? Okay, he played a, a, a major role at that very moment. But let's go a little farther. Mom told Advaic that he needed to get into the water. What if Mom had just said, ah, oh, you know what, just another man drowning. Who cares? He probably wouldn't have done it because he didn't do it until she urged him that he needed to do it. Dad was in the pool trying to do something. When Advaic pulled the man up from the bottom of the pool, his dad pushed him over to the edge of the pool. Remember, his dad couldn't swim, but he was at least doing something. So maybe you can't preach, but you can sit. Right? You aren't going to drown in here, so that's good news. You don't need a little floaty to be able to make it through the evangelistic meetings. But remember, even though his father couldn't swim, he did what he could. The neighbors and the uncle couldn't swim, but they could pull the man out of the water. The uncle could also give him CPR, which he did. And someone called 911, which brought out the paramedics who had the oxygen and the training. Someone built the oxygen tank, and somebody built the mask, and someone built the ambulance that brought the paramedics, and someone built the hospital that he was taken to, and someone trained the doctors and the nurses who cared for the man, and someone taught a bank how to swim. Brothers and sisters, as I looked at that, it suddenly dawned on me how important all of us are. Because that man that was saved that day from drowning, that 34-year-old man whose name I don't even know, who went home that night as though nothing had happened, 
did so because of what everybody had done before that to prepare for that moment. Amen. I'd like you to apply that lesson to our <coughs> work of saving souls for eternity. You didn't just come to church to hear a nice sermon. You came to be encouraged to do love and good works. Not of your own, but the kind that only Jesus can do in you. <coughs> That's why you and I give our lives to Jesus every day. Because we want to be in tune and touch with Jesus. We want Him to live in our hearts and lives. We want others to see, not ourselves, but we want others to see.